Oscar Bevis for IFL TV in association with MTK Global. I'm here with a phone interview, or video interview, should I say, with my good friend Lou de Bella Lou. I haven't caught up with you since Miami. Um, you are right in the epicenter of the crisis at the moment. Uh, how's life and how's lockdown? I'm getting losing my mind, but I think all of us are. I mean, it's it's not it's not easy, but um, you know, we do what we need to do. I mean, the, the strange thing is, I really do believe that locking ourselves up and being bored to death is really making a difference and saving lives. So for the time being, you know, we've just got to do what they're telling us to do. Um, you know, we've lost a bunch of people I know and, and, and some people boxing. Um, you know, we just this week, you know, the great referee, Eddie Cotton, you know, who's a big, strong guy, even though he was 70. Um, but, you know, we, we, Jimmy Glenn's in the hospital, but he's doing better. So I, there's good news out there. I, look, we're going to get out of this and we're just a boxing in some semblance of a, a more normal life, I hope, I hope soon enough. I mean, from what we're getting over in the UK, it just seems like New York's overflowing. Like, the, the hospitals can't cope. Uh, you know, we're hearing that the numbers are higher than most countries. I mean, what's it actually like being... We're getting the, the hospitals and stuff, that stuff's getting better. Fewer people are getting admitted. Fewer people are being put on ventilators. We're still losing a lot, a lot of people, and a lot of people are still getting sick. But in terms of, like, you know, it, it, it's not as crazy as it was a few weeks ago. But it's still, you know, we're still in the middle of a big crisis. And, a lot of people are dying every day and, and, you know, we're not getting back to boxing in the next, I don't think in the next month or two. I think we're looking at the earliest I can envision a return to our sport, even in a studio setting, um, would be like, I think probably around July, because a lot of stuff has to get taken care of, you know, before that. We have to assure the health, health and safety of, of everybody. And we're also regulated in the United States. We're state regulated. Um, I know where you are, it's more of a national regulation, but you're regulated too. So we're going to have to deal with a lot of things. You know, we have doctors at ringside, medicals that have to go through state governments. There's a lot of things. It's not like it can't be done. I mean, we're going to have to adjust and we're going to do it, but it's going to probably take a little bit of time. And I think we're probably looking until July before you see any form of a fight. I don't care who's promoting it. Like if, if you're seeing it from a legitimate promoter and not by somebody who's being a desperado, I, I don't think you're going to see a boxing match until July. I mean, it's put things into perspective. I saw a tweet earlier, because in this country, obviously, football is our main sport, our number one sport. And I saw somebody say, look, it puts it into perspective when they're releasing uh, death numbers in the UK and they're also having meetings about when to start the next football game. So it sort of has put things into perspective. I mean, tomorrow is meant to be hooker progre, um, or tonight, sorry, is meant to be hooker progre. I mean, but it sort of slipped to the back of everyone's mind now. Yeah, because it, you got to just have perspective. I mean, you know... People like, you know, guy, you think, you think the NBA is thinking about their playoff games right now. I think the players are thinking about that when one of a, a more popular guys in the NBA lost his mom this week to, to coronavirus. I, I mean, it's happening all over. It's touching too many people. And by the way, even if you're like, even if you're not like freaking out and you're not the kind of person that's really anxious right now, like even if you got this and, you know, you got it in a calm, peaceful place. You still want to be with your family now. Like you still, you don't want to like. If you're a player in a league, you want to, you want to go to the middle of nowhere for four months to be away from everybody during something like this. I mean, there's a lot of things that are operating in the return of of sport, and I and and I think you know it's going to be complicated. Uh, you know, they're 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 boxing unlike a lot of other sports. Though we don't have a commission, we don't have a governing body per se, so it's much more of a who wants to jump first and where will they be allowed to? So, but, but I, I got the sense, I got to be honest, I don't see, I know well I came in a long time. I mean, I, mean, I know every, the, the, it's either going to be Eddie or, or ESPN or, or PBC, Al Heyman, you know, who's going to come back with the first event in the United States in all probability. Um, Eddie, Eddie may come back with the first event and do it out of the UK. I think that's very possible, doing it in a, in a, without an audience in, in somewhere in, in the UK. I could I could see that, but I, I don't see anybody doing it irresponsibly. I think that I think at this point we're gonna in boxing at least I'm hearing the same things when I speak to Eddie or speak to Bob or speak to Al, and I've spoken to all three of them during this pandemic, you know. And I think that you're gonna see, you know, we're gonna come back when it's safe and responsible, and and you can pretty much bank on the fact that we're gonna come back with no audiences. Now the interesting thing is gonna be. What is that? What kind of fights are going to be feasible without an audience? You know, or what's the most likely big, big fight to occur without 
being in the same situation we were in pre-pandemic in, in December or January. Um, because I think that the lack, you know, boxing, unlike some other sports, the live, the, 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 the revenue in the, in the arena sometimes is the majority of the revenue. Sometimes it's 40, 50 percent of the revenue, you know, other times or, or more of the revenue, even a big fight. And, and you know, other times the, the, the site is much less significant because television pays a lot of money for a particular fighter who doesn't sell tickets anywhere. So like what kind of fights economically and, and from a business sensibility perspective are we going to see when we have no audiences? I think that's an interesting question. Hopefully boxing can set the precedent of when to return and how to conduct themselves properly. But did you sort of see the private island thing as a bit insensitive? I don't like, honestly, Dana can do what Dana wants to do. And, and if, if he can get away with it and do it, um, they are their own little universe. So if they won't want to assume risk, they, they, they pretty much govern themselves. You know, they're not like, they have their own, unlike other, some other sports. Their, their referee works for the UFC. Their doctors are UFC doctors. They have much more of an ability. Their regulation is different in the United States than boxing is. So it's easier for Dana to do it. And then going to find some way, look, if Dana could find some way to get it done and whatever, I mean, it's his prerogative. I, I, I personally, I personally don't think the world is awaiting. I mean, I, I Eddie made a comment yesterday. And some people jumped on him and said, "Oh, no, no, how about?" You know, it, it's sort of true right now. I mean, like it's it's the world's not waiting with bated breath for two guys to beat the shit out of one another in a boxing ring. It, it, it's really not. I mean, but like, but but we got to get back to a semblance of normal. Fighters have to eat. We all have to get back to living our lives. People want to be entertained. And by the way, boxing being a mano a mano or woman against woman sport with only two combatants and a referee that probably can be instructed on how to socially distance, honestly, because what, if, if in, a, in an empty room, a fighter is going to be able to hear a referee scream break. And if the motherfucker won't break, he loses the point. And there's not, no three warnings because, you know, we got to be safe. I mean, we got to make certain adjustments. It's going to take a little bit of time to think all the way through them. I mean, in boxing, you also need judges. If it's a title fight, you need judges from a particular organization. Are they going to be able to travel? Are there enough of them locally? How do fighters get to the fights? That's why maybe Dana's island idea, if you want to call it an island, maybe it's a self-contained area. Maybe he's going to move the entire UFC to a particular piece of land, and everyone's going to live there, sequestered. That's the safest way to do it. So when he says an island, maybe he's not meaning an island floating in the middle of the fucking water. Maybe he's meaning an island, meaning a self-contained little world, right? But he's in a better, probably, position to do it quicker. And I think UFC will be the first combat sport to come back. And Dana says he's going to come back in May. You know what? I believe he'll find a way to come back in May. Yeah, I mean, the long and the short of it is people do need their downtime as well. And for a lot of people, downtime, watching, going to watch boxing is where they would spend their expense, their extra money. And that's their, that's their sense of fun. How do I have fun? I go to fun events. I go to the tavern or pub with my buddies and talk, tell stories. Or I go to a nice dinner with whoever. Okay, I can't do any of that. So, like, I'm losing my mind. And I think everyone wants combat sports back. Who's a combat sports nut? You want what you love. I mean, we get into This is our form of entertainment. We want it back. But, fuck, we got to be safe. You know, and there's going to be, you know, there's a lot of considerations that are going to come into this. And, and also, what... What are, the, what are the networks and streaming services going to want in terms of big programming? With all due respect, it makes no sense. Boxing can't afford, or, and it's the zone certainly, it would be stupid business to do a Canelo triple G fight in an empty room. I, I don't see that happening in an empty room. You know, there are other fights. You can make other fights that are more cost effective in an empty room. You know, the other thing is, you know, maybe you're going to see some fights go to Dubai or Saudi Arabia or somewhere over in the Middle East where there hasn't been the same type of outbreak and, and, you know, establishing a camp there where everyone's tested and can be there. Maybe you could see an Anthony Joshua fight in, I'm making this up. I mean, I'm, Eddie, I'm not, based on no knowledge of anything, but conjecturing that Anthony Joshua could fight Kulev somewhere in a, you know, in, in, that would pay a site fee and maybe they're a socially distanced, you know, VIP little area, you know, little setups around that people pay a lot of money for in the Middle East. I mean, I think people are going to have to get creative, you know. Um, it, it, these are, you know, interesting, trying times. You know, we're not coming back 
Like it's not going to be the that the force that's going to open up. The water is going to be fucking pouring out of it when you see the first boxing card. You're not going to. I don't believe you're going to see boxing's going to start up again and there's going to be fights every Friday and Saturday night and everyone's going to run to get the fights and we're going to start with, with something weird that we've never lived through before. You know, we're going to start probably in empty rooms with no live audiences. And the television is, you know, is going to look very different than what we're used to seeing. It's going to feel different. I mean, energy, you know, and people are going to try to figure out how to best present it. But the safety issues, the regulatory issues, the, the testing issues, there's a lot of stuff to be work, you know, worked out. We're going to come back, but I don't know when we're going to get back to normal. I don't expect that I'm going to be promoting a boxing show in New York City for the rest of 2020. That's just realistic. I mean, I'm not, you know, uh, bullshit anybody. I don't see there's any way I'm going to be promoting a boxing show. Certainly not a boxing show with any, any audience, but I don't see how I'm going to be promoting a boxing show in New York City the rest of the year. I find it very doubtful. One thing boxers do have is a bit too much time on their hands at the moment. I mean, we've reached out to so many boxers, spoke to so many you know, boxers in the States and here. I want to get your thoughts on some Devin Haney comments uh, that have appeared on yeah. social media when he was speaking to a news outlet. He said he would never lose to a white man. Um, I know. some controversy. Never lose to a white man. Look, first of all, first of all, like, I don't think Devin Haney's a racist. I know him and his dad a long time. I don't think he's a racist. I think he's a really brash, a little bit overconfident. I think he should he, thinks his shit doesn't stink. He hasn't been tested yet. And he's got incredible confidence. He has incredible skill. He's incredible. I love the kid. I actually like the kid. I don't think he's a bad kid. And as a fighter, I think he's a sensational athlete. And I've, I've, I just think, I think they're part of it, to be honest with you, is he sort of believed it. And I mean, I didn't like the way, when I watched the interview itself, I didn't like the way he said it, sort of. I just didn't like it. There's no need to bring race into it. It's ill-advised. And you know what? The kid is smart enough, and the father is smart enough, he said what he said, but I, you know, he didn't apologize today. He said, I'm not a racist, and I believe him. But you know what? If I was him, I'd stay away from those fucking kind of comments. They're not positive. They're not, they, they, they don't ignore any good feeling among people. They're just divisive. It's unnecessary. You know, it's unnecessary. I'm not going to slam him. He's a young kid. But I'll tell you truthfully, style wise, the average white fighter is not, it's not even the average. Over, Lomachenko, my, I, I can't really, I mean, there's very few. It's not racial. It's just also speed. Like, you, you don't want to get into, I think from the kid's standpoint, he was thinking to myself, I, my, the way I fight, my, 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 my whole game, I'm unlikely to lose to a white fight. But it, there's no need to say that kind of thing. There's no need to bring it into everything. There aren't a lot of white fighters out there who, who can beat Devin Haney. There aren't a lot of black fighters out there or, or Latin fighters out there who can beat Devin Haney. Um, I think there. I, I I I think that if you went through the hardest fights for him in boxing, you'd probably find something of a spectrum, you know. And and and, um, and Lomachenko is a really hard fight for anybody. I mean, come on. I mean, Lomachenko's footwork and speed. Even if you're really like trying to like the idea that you're putting you're labeling Lomachenko as the stereotype of a white fighter. What's the stereotype of a white fighter? It's 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 Mickey Ward. Or uh, Shane Neary, I mean, remember the uh, Shane Neary there? It, it, it's the the warrior, the Rocky Graziano, you know. But Lomachenko is just a superb athlete and, and incredible footwork. He's a stereotype of nothing. And why are we stereotyping each other anyway? And particularly right now, no one wants to. Even if like Haney's not a bad kid, and he's not, and he's not a racist, he's not. Okay, but we're going. We're all going through this bullshit right now. And no one wants to, I think people overreacted a little bit, but I get it because we're all on fucking, what's that? We're bored. We're sitting around. No one wants to listen to someone be a little bit like an asshole right now for no reason. And there was sort of no reason to say it. You know what I mean? Even if you believed it, and there was no reason for him to say it. We all got to try to like not get under each other's skin for no fucking reason and not be in, you know, not, not try to fire shit up. Even if you think it's promotion, the racial shit shouldn't be part of a promotion it's a you know obviously no one can say race doesn't matter you we we look white and someone else looks brown or black or tan or whatever there and and, and there are a lot of fucking miserable wretched people in the world so it's bullshit that it doesn't matter i mean i i don't have to worry about getting a taxi cab in new york late at night you know i don't have to worry about people crossing the street before there was fucking coronavirus like, like they were concerned about someone not wearing a mask 
you know what I mean? So, like, I think, you know, uh, he did something stupid. He didn't do something racist. He didn't say something racist. He said something stupid. I hope he leaves race out of it in the future. But, you know, uh, it's, it's being overblown. Yeah, I think that's the general consensus, the fact that race affects so much in life. Let's at least try and leave it out of boxing. I remember there was a reporter who tried to bring it into the uh, Wild Fury build-up because it was Black History Month. But yeah, I mean, we could go on about this for hours, but I do want to talk, of course, about Deontay and this step-aside money. I mean, like I said, boxing's just got people talking. It's just making, this lockdown's going to end up making the whole heavyweight division just a lot, a lot more messier. It's not going to be that messy. There's going to be a Fury Wilder fight at some point when it makes commercial sense. Deontay's uh, had, had surgery. He's had an injury from what I've read. I don't know anything. Believe me, I have no proprietary information, but from what I've read. And, and you know, he's going to use this time to heal, to change his corner. You know, I, I, or he's adding people to his corner. I'm glad to hear Mark Breland's still there. And, and I'm sure he's going to try to be better for the next fight whenever it happens. I don't see, could that fight happen in a, on a pay-per-view in an empty room? Who knows? Anything's possible. I, I don't know. But, but um, I think that fight's going to happen. He had a contract. He exercised his rematch. I don't think Fury's, Fury's still going to get paid a lot of money to fight a guy he has to be pretty comfortable that he beats. And Deontay wants his, his reputation back and his, his belts back. So I believe that that fight's going to happen. And, you know, if AG's just trying to, you know, stir up the pot a little bit, make some noise, it's fine. But I don't believe anyone's taking step-aside money, particularly in a fucking environment where there's no tickets for sale. Oh, yeah, they're going to take step-aside money for what? To go fight the fight in, 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 in Dubai or, 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 or Saudi Arabia or fight the fight with social distancing and, and no normal crowd. I don't know. I, it's not happening right now. So like, let's say, again, you know, I'm getting tired of bullshit. I'm not paying. I got to be honest. I, I'm doing a lot of these shows because I'm bored. Like I'm talking to a lot of guys like you, particularly people I like and, and particularly people I wouldn't have, not you because I would talk to you anyway, but I mean, I'm giving interviews maybe I wouldn't have done because I have nothing to do right now. I'm just doing this to chat. But I got to be honest, I'm not really actively reading everything that's out there in boxing. Like, I'm not on boxing scene. I don't really give a fuck how most of the fighters of boxing are staying in shape. I mean, I, I, I really don't care. I mean, like, God bless you, and I hope you're well. And I'm more concerned with fighters I have that don't have a lot of money, that aren't the ones you guys are interviewing, that have to fight three or four times a year to pay their bills. I'm worried about how they're fucking paying their bills, you know, and whether, like, you know, what they're going to do. I'm worried about whether they have the appropriate information as independent contractors to seek the economic assistance in the United States that's available to the fighters. You know, I, I, there's, there's some resources out there. I want people to use social media now, use Google, use what's out there to, you know, if you have a contract with me and you're not fighting and you made 60 grand last year, you can get unemployment up to $50,000 or some form of it as an independent contract. I'm not an accountant. You need to talk to somebody that knows or get the information from the right person, which is not me. But, uh, but I want you to go out there and, and seek what, what's available to you. I'm worried about them. I, I don't care about like, I'm not paying that much attention on you know, what the fuck is going on or what people are saying. Obviously, this has gone on for quite a while. It's going to go on for longer. But I have to pick up on what you said there, the fact that you're only doing interviews almost because you are bored. Um, would you have said that the first couple of weeks was actually a welcome break from boxing, perhaps? You know what? That's a very cool question. Um, no, only because boxing's not the only thing I do. I, I am um, the managing like partner and managing owner of, of um, two minor league baseball teams, the Richmond Flying Squirrels, which are the San Francisco Giants, um, double A affiliate in Richmond, Virginia, and the Montgomery Biscuits, um, which is Tampa Rays, uh, double A team in, in Montgomery, Alabama. And normally March is when we're gearing up for the season. And I love opening day in Major League Baseball. You guys are not baseball fans over there, I know, but it's almost like a, a, a ritual thing here. It's like a really, it's like the first day. I, I don't even know if you have, I don't think you have an equivalent because I think they pay soccer through the more of the year. But like opening day is almost like a, a, a spiritual thing here. And, um, you know, I'd be preparing and working hard on baseball. Instead, I'm trying to figure out what to do when there's not going to be baseball and what to do if we don't come back. I mean, in, we, by definition, minor league baseball is totally dependent on the gate, on the, on the concessions. It's on people eating, drinking, buying souvenirs in, the, in our store and the money we get from ticket revenue and suites. That's what we're dependent on. And that none of that 
if you're not allowed to play baseball in front of people. So I, I pretty much had to work hard. I, I didn't really get a break. I mean, I've been working hard, but, I, but it's been negative energy. I mean, you know, it's not fun to furlough people who are your good friends and, you were, and, your, and your colleagues. Like, you know, put people on furlough is not fun. And I've had to do that with a lot of people who I consider friends. And, and it, it, it's been, I mean, talking to you is sort of something of a break. It's like occupies my time, but I'm not, you know, literally this week, you know, I had to furlough a lot of, and, and, uh, and there's also a lot of uncertainty about whether, there's not only uncertainty about when boxing comes back or whether there are crowds. We pretty much know baseball is going to come back at first without crowds. But what does that mean for our season in the minor leagues? Because we don't have a TV deal. See, we're not getting big TV revenue. So, if if we're told it's not going to be a crowd, there's not going to be probably mine. There's not going to be minor league baseball. So it, I, I got a lot on my mind. You know, I, I'm thinking about other things. I'm just like, you know, I'm not. You know, right now. And by the way, you, you notice how many guys are calling each other out on social media right now. Fight, yeah. Fighters like seem to want to avoid each other for like the plague before they were unable to fight. Now that they're unable to fight, now they're all talking shit. Now everybody's out there talking shit. Everybody's right. I'll fight you for fucking nothing, motherfucker. Now the government are telling you to avoid each other, and now they want to. Exactly. But now, but now, by the way, now, by the way, you can't, like, sell the tickets. You know what? But now I'll fight you in your mother's room, motherfucker. I'll fight you anywhere you want. Right? I, I, I find that pretty amusing, but I got, I got to be honest with you. It's getting on my nerves. I don't want, I, I like it. I think, I think it's fun. I think it's fun that people are, are talking the game and that, that fighters are engaged. Uh, you know, I'm not going to criticize a fighter for attempting to keep his name out there and, 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 and have some fun. You know what I mean? I just don't want to see it. It's like not doing anything for me. Right now. I was like, you know what, when this is all over, then come to me and tell me that with the new, you know, with the new structure of money that's going to be available, you still want to go and fight the toughest fight for as much as is fair. When you tell me that, I'll be really, like, dying to hear that. But, you know, right right now, it's, I just find it sort of funny. Just finally, before we wrap this up, um, the boxing landscape, how is it? You know, I've asked this to fighters, uh, promoters, people on the British boxing board, and everyone seems to... The general consensus seems to be that it's going to be magnified interest. There's going to be better fights, better cards. When boxing is back up and run, running as normal, do you see the landscape being similar? I, I, I'm not going to – like, i got to be honest with you. I, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not negative, but I, but I think that, 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 like, that very singular kind of messaging right now that we're going to come back bigger and better than ever and you're going to see only the biggest fights come back and they're all going to come back quicker, and then we're going to see more boxing, so boxing fans are going to have an end of the year like they never had. That's fucking rubbish. Stop. Stupid. Stop. Use your brain. Come on. We're going to come back, and we're going to enjoy the fights we get. I think, I think that even if they're the, – look, the fights are going to – the fights are going to come back aren't only going to be the big. They're going to be the most economically feasible. You're coming back without big revenue streams. And you're going to have to sp- you're going to have to spend more money to stage a fight in front of nobody, and you're going to lose all those revenue streams. And the fighters aren't going to want to readjust their pay scales by gigantic percentages. And, every- and it's going to be resistance at first to adjusting money. It's like no, you're going to see some of the fights. I think are going to come back first are going to be ones that are cost effective, where the gate, you know, where the the the, 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 the you know like a I'm making this up, but a Selby Cambosis fight is not a super expensive fight. A pro gray hooker fight is not uh, a Canelo fight. And 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 you know th- there are fights like you know a lot. You know there 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 are, there are fights that are less damaged by not being played out in front of an audience, and 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 are less damaged by losing those revenue streams. So. I mean, I, I, I think it's naive to think no, we're going to come back like the rest of the world. You think restaurants are going to come back and it's good. What do you think? You're going to open up a restaurant. You, you can now go to a restaurant. Well, maybe you got to wear a mask. Who the fuck does people want to do that? You got to wear a mask. Well, I don't know. Except when you're, what do you got to lift it to, to put the stuff in your mouth? All right. Tables are going to be six feet apart. Right. How many restaurants can be able to economically open that way? How many are going to want? How many people are really going to want to go out and socialize in that freakish manner? It's going to like, yeah, but you know what? We'll adjust. We'll get to a place that's better and more normal, but it's going to be a process. It's going to be a process 
in football uh, on your end of the pond. It's going to be a process in the NBA and the NFL here. It's going to be a process with combat sports. It's a process. And not getting back. We're not going to have a, 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 a our first quarterback's not going to look like the last quarter of last year. It's not, it's not. But we need to get our foot in the water. We need to get back up and operating on some sane, normal, safe level when it's appropriate. I, I, I'm hoping that by the midsummer there's there's a way of beginning to to you know test things out and open things up. I don't think it's happening before then. And and um and if it's a little bit after then, then it is it's when it's safe. We got to do what we got to do.